Today we're in chapter 5 of John, and we already have been here, but we're moving on, and we'll begin at verse 16. And uh, let's see, I'll read verses 16 to verse 16. I'll just stay at verse 16, and then we'll get into our study. <laughs> in John chapter 5, verse 16, John writes, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus, and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So these things that John is referring to is uh, the healing that uh, Jesus had performed on a man. And uh, for performing this healing on this lame man, this paralyzed man, uh, the Jewish officials wanted to put him to death. And the reason they want to put him to death is because they believe that he has broken the law of Moses. Um... The fact is, he didn't break the law of Moses. You see, in the law of Moses, there's no prohibition for doing good. And that's what Jesus did. He did a good thing. He healed someone in need. In in Matthew chapter 12, verses 10 through 12, uh, there's an interesting thing that occurs in a synagogue. And uh, Jesus had had healed a man with a, a withered is, is healing a man with a withered hand. It says in uh, Matthew 12, 10, Behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. They asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And so for them, it was wrong for him to do good on the Sabbath, but the law didn't prohibit doing that which was good. And Jesus addresses that. And so again, they're persecuting Jesus, according to verse 16. They're seeking to kill him because he had done these things on Shabbat or on the Sabbath. And so... As this is taking place, verse 17, Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father. And I want you to note this in verse 18, making himself equal with God. And so... How is Jesus responding to their persecution? Well, he points to his relationship to the Father. And and he's making a point here. He's saying, my Father is working constantly, and so am I. You see, without God, the universe would cease to exist, and man would not survive. He sustains the universe. He saves. He performs works of compassion. He, He shows love and mercy. And Jesus is also at work constantly. That's what he's saying. My father's been working until now, and I have been working. God continuously is at work, and Jesus said, and I am continuously at work also. According to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, who being the brightness of his, of God's glory, the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God is at work constantly, and so is Jesus. He upholds all things by the word of his power. That is something constant. In Psalm 121, verse 4, the psalmist said, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Thank God he doesn't take naps. He's always awake. He's always alert. He's always doing the work. And so he says, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Now, I want you to note again. He says, my father, my father. So he called God his own father. And and they understood him as saying that he's equal with God. That's what it says in verse 18. When it says the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. And so he calls God his own father, and they understand. They say he's making himself equal to God. Now the word equal, for those of you who like a little Greek once in a while, 
the word equal in the Greek is isos, I-S-O-S. And what that means is it's equal in kind, equal in substance, equal in essence, equal in quality. Equal speaks of being the same nature. So Jesus Christ is calling God his Father, and he is equal with God. That's what you see in John 5, 18. He's claiming equality with God. And the Jews see this and understand this and reason this is blasphemy. Now, in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, in chapter 24, verse 16, Moses writes, Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. So that's why they're so upset. They hear him. He says, My father is working. He had just in their sight broken the Sabbath. And now he's claiming equality with God. And for that reason, they're seeking to put him to death. And by the way, they continue to seek to put him to death until they finally achieve that at the end of his ministry. That's what led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They never forget what he said. And they used what he said to formulate a reason to kill him. Later on in John, in chapter 19, verses 6 and 7, it reads, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. So this is the charge that is later on lodged against Christ for him to be put to death because he has made himself, they say, the Son of God. And so he has made himself equal with God, they're saying. Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. In other words, I only do the things that the Father does. I'm not independent of him, and nor am I his rival. I, I do these things, he's saying, by virtue of having the same nature. In, in John 6, verse 38, Jesus says there, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus is performing works that his father has sent him to do. He's not in rivalry with him. He's simply doing that which the father has said for him to do. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, it reads, I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And that's why Christ came. So he said in verse 19, I, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever, whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So the Father shows him all things that he does, and Jesus does all things that he has shown. God has not revealed all things to any prophet, philosopher, or apostle. There are things that only he knows. There are things that are his secrets, like it says uh, in Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You see, on occasion, he reveals some of those things to his prophets, but the father didn't keep anything from the son because he loves the son and he reveals all things to him. Somebody said, because God shows him all that he does, he must possess omniscience, for to no finite mind could be imparted a knowledge of all the works of God. So once again, he says, he shows me all things and he has comprehended all of these things because he's God in the flesh. Notice again, it says, the father loves the son. The father loves the son because that's what fathers do. And you want to know something? I'll say this very briefly, but it's true. Fathers love the son because that's what dads do. And I have my son's I have my grandsons, but I have my sons. 
and uh, and I love them. I love them because that's what dads do. That's all there is to it. You know, from the time they were little to the time that they outgrew me, which didn't take much time at all. <laughs> but from that time to now, they'll always be my sons, and they'll always have that very special place in my heart. And, and uh, a father loves a son. And God says, I love my son. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible says that a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus could say it, the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Notice, he says, I'm acting according to his revelation. What he reveals, I do. And in verse 20, he says, he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Well, when you read the Gospel of John and just look at the seven selected miracles, by this time, we've seen Jesus do incredible things. He, he's already turned water into wine. He's already healed a nobleman's son. He just crippled, healed a crippled man. But there are going to be greater works done in the future, and it's going to cause people to marvel because that's what miracles do. They, a miracle is something that is done by God. It's something that there is no natural uh, or logical uh, reasoning. It's something beyond what any human being can do. When a miracle is done, it is something that no human being can do. And so God's miracles are intended to draw people's attention to Christ. There are miracles that are done that are false. They could be genuine in terms of the fact that a miracle occurs or something supernatural happens. But when God does a miracle, the miracle that he does is intended to bring attention to his son, Jesus Christ. So you see that in the Gospel of John. You see that Jesus turned the water into wine, and the people marvel over that. And you see that he heals this man here just recently, and they marvel over that because that's what he does. He, he does miracles, but he's saying there will be even greater works done in the future that will cause you to marvel. He's going to feed 5,000. And it's, just not, it's not just 5,000 because the number 5,000 speaks of the number of men. That didn't include the women and the children. He's going to walk on the sea. He's going to heal a man born blind. He's, he's going to raise a friend of his from the dead. Greater works? Yes. And ultimately... He's going to be the judge over all humanity. Greater works. In verse 21, for as a father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. His hearers knew that God has the power to raise the dead. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6, uh, it, it reads, The Lord kills and make a, makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he brings up. And he is. He's able to raise the dead, and he gives life to whomever he desires. He can give physical life, and he does when he does these miracles of raising the dead. We see that when he raises Jairus' daughter. We see that when he, he raises the widow of Nain's son from the dead. We'll see that in the Gospel of John when he raises Lazarus. But he is the one who gives life. He gives life to the, to the people who are spiritually dead. And he can also give life to those who are physically dead. You see, he says, as, as he's going on, he says uh, in verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, the Father will judge all mankind, but he does so through Jesus Christ, who is the final judge. In Romans 14, verses 10 through 12, Paul asked this question. He said, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. 
So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. That ought to cause us to have a holy sense of fear. I mean, I don't know, some of you in this room, probably as I look around here, probably a lot of you have stood before a judge. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow, but as. <laughs> and there's a certain fear that you've had or you can have. Because he has power. He has authority, doesn't he? He's got years of your life at his discretion. He's going to make a judgment. He's going to make a ruling. And I can still remember in those old days, you know, before I knew the Lord, I stood before a judge, I've done that, and, and the fear you can, you can feel, the fear you can feel because you know the ruling is gonna impact you maybe for many, many years, many years. And you stand before him with trembling. Some guys I knew uh, when we were in the world, they, you know, they were dopers or whatever, they got caught with weed or whatever because weed used to be an offense. Now it's a profitable market here in California, but it used to be an offense. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was almost, it, was, it was almost funny, if it weren't tragic, how my friends suddenly would clean up. I mean, guys who never got haircuts were suddenly cutting their hair. Guys who didn't wear shoes or slacks were suddenly putting on ties and on shoes and slacks when they went before the judge. And they, you could always tell that they weren't used to that because they were kind of awkward and stiff in these clothes because they're not used to dressing like that. But they dressed up like that to try and, and uh, convince the judge that they were really decent and weren't as bad as the, the crime that they were being accused of uh, committing. So they dressed themselves up. And they tried to appear like they were okay, good people and all of that. But the judge would see through them because the charges were there. And he was able to look at the charges and they were able to make a judgment. So you know that going before even a human judge is, <laughs> is a frightening thing. Because you know that he has power, he has authority. It's been given to him by the government. He's able to put you away. But we don't think in terms of standing before the judge of the whole earth. I guess that's just too far beyond us to really, really consider. Maybe it is. The idea that you will stand before somebody who sees everything and knows everything. You can't hide from him. You can't lie to him. There's no, there's no pleading guilty with an explanation. I mean, you're, you're going to be judged by the righteous judge. And Jesus is speaking about that. And, and he is the one who is going to judge all mankind. And when you stand before God in judgment, Jesus in judgment, you don't have anybody that you can pull alongside of you as a character witness. You can't bring somebody in to plead your cause. You can't, you can't have people come in and say, well, you know, I, I, I wrote a letter of recommendation for him. I want, I want it read and read into the record because he's really a good, you can't do any of that. It's just you and God. And it's interesting how they define, uh, they describe Christ in Revelation. He's, his eyes like a flaming fire. This is the one who can see right through you. This is the one who, who is judging in righteousness. And that's what Jesus is speaking about here. You don't ever put that, don't ever think that lightly. Don't think lightly about that. I mean, I've seen guys who are all brave and this and that until they're in front of authority. And suddenly they melt because they know that they're going down. They know that they're going to spend some time behind bars. And they're all like this and that before they go before the judge. But suddenly when that man is saying, I give you X amount of years, it's an entirely different thing. Well, at least in a few years you may, might get out. But when you stand before the Lord in final judgment and you're standing there in your own, your own righteousness and not in his, there's no getting out. The sentence is final. And so Jesus is turning this right now into a very, very, very um, powerful conversation, a, com a powerful declaration because he says it, the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son so, in Acts 17, 31, it reads, He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. You see, the dead will be resurrected and 
will ultimately be judged, and there are no second chances. Psalm 89, verse 48 says, What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? So this knowledge provokes us to share with loved ones and people in general. That's one of the things that motivates us to share our faith, is the knowledge that someone I love deeply is going to stand before God. And that that knowledge produces a seriousness of spirit, and it also produces a humility. The psalmist in Psalm 39.4, this is a beautiful psalm, in Psalm 39.4, he says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am, that I might not puff myself up and think I am great when in fact I'm weak. Psalm 90 verse 10 says, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So Psalm 90 verse 12 goes on to say, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When you're young, you think that you've got nothing but time in front of you. But as you grow older, you realize that you have less days ahead than you have behind. And you should be numbering your days so that you might have a heart of wisdom to know how to live in such a way as is pleasing to the Lord and is a blessing to others. He says in verse 23, that all should honor the Son. Now notice this, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There are guys who will say, people who will say, well, yeah, I believe in God. It's Jesus I don't believe in. You know, yeah, you know, that's what makes Christians different, they'll say, than me. My faith does not include Christ as honoring him as God. I recognize him as a prophet. I recognize him as a good man. I recognize him as a teacher. But I do not recognize him, they may say, as God. And yet, I want you to see this, verse 23. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And he who doesn't honor the Son, Jesus said, does not honor the Father who sent him. So he says, just as. And I want you to notice that. That all should honor the Son just as. The, the, the words just as means even as or in proportion. In the degree, in the same degree. In other words, Somebody said it this way, there is no question that this verse is commanding believers to honor, revere, or venerate Jesus to the same degree as we honor, revere, and venerate the Father. Since the Father is to be honored as God and to the greatest extent, so is Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is not a mere prophet. That's something important to know. He is not a mere prophet. He said, you honor the son, even as in like manner, similar to the way you honor God himself. Very strong scripture. People ask, did Jesus ever claim to be God? This is one of the scriptures where he is definitely doing that. He's saying, <coughs> you need to honor him. He is claiming equality with God. He is saying, if you do not honor Jesus, you do not honor God. In 1 John 2, 23, John said it like this. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You cannot have, according to Christian theology, you cannot have a relationship with God if you do not honor Jesus Christ as God. That is a very important thing. That is what is called a cardinal doctrine. That is an essential to our faith. You cannot look at Jesus as being just a good person, a great teacher. He's God in the flesh. And that's why they understood what he was saying when he said, God is my father. And that's why they said he's making himself equal with God. And instead of denying that, Jesus actually clarifies that. And that's why he says, you need to honor me like you honor 
the Father. So as ruler, Jesus is to be honored. The word honored means to be valued or esteemed. It speaks of being revered or prized. And this kind of honor is reserved for God alone. If you take scriptures down and notes, Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. Isaiah 48, 11, I will not give my glory to another. So Jesus is saying that in order to honor God, you must honor the Son. But the Old Testament says, I am God, I'm the Lord, that's my name. I give my honor and my glory to no one else. Jesus is claiming equality with God. And John makes it clear later on in his epistle, if you don't honor the Son, you don't have the Son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father either. And that ought to be for us who are Christians. That's one of those things that, I'll put it like this from a practical way, that is one of those things that motivated me to share my faith. Because one, Jesus is going to judge every living being. Everyone shall appear before the throne of God and give an account of themselves. And when I, and I was a brand new Christian when I was taught that because it's right here in the word. But when, when that was clearly presented to me, that's why I spoke to my parents. That's why. That's why I went across the street the day I got saved and shared with a friend of mine's mom. And that's why I went home and, and shared with, with, with my sister Madeline and my sister Becky. And that's why eventually I was able to have a conversation with my parents and, and pour out my concern for them. They needed Jesus Christ. Look, at if you got to heaven without Jesus, what's the point of evangelization? If you could get to heaven by just being a good person and believing in, in a God, then Jesus died in vain. There's no reason for Christ to come. But you can't. You see, the Bible says it like this. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man, no man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of Christ. So everything bows down in honor and reverence to him. And in heaven, in heaven, when we're there, do you think we're going to be bouncing around acting all sly and cool? No. When we're in heaven, we're going to be on our faces before him. For eternity? No, I rather think not. But on occasion, you better believe it. And when I see him for the first time, I suspect that when I see him, my first thing is going to be to hit the ground. I suspect that. I suspect that. The, the second, I, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I could be wrong. Me? Nah. No, I could be wrong. But I suspect that. Won't, wouldn't you? Don't you think perhaps maybe that when you see the one <laughs> Jesus, I, I get carried away with that when I think about it. I do. When I see him. And I've, I've, I've spent a long time, a good, the best portion of my life, following Christ best portion of my life reading a book about him reading a book about him you know and you, you read about him and what he's done and you get to know him having not seen him yet you love him it's kind of like the first time I saw Jerusalem back in 1983 I, I've read the Bible for a while before then Gospel is filled with references to the city and events that took place in it. I had in my mind's eye pictures that I'd seen. And then we're in a bus and we're traveling in this little winding road. And a friend of mine who had been to Israel before turns to me and he says to me, we're going to be coming around a bend in just a moment. You're going to look to the right. He says, that'll be your first time you ever see Jerusalem. And I remember I was seated there in the bus, just like with an anticipation and coming around the bend of this road and the city kind of like springs out. It just like unfolds, it explodes. And I'm looking at the city that I had read about, but now I see with my eyes. 
Or, or when you think of Job, and Job in the book of Job is the most righteous man. God speaks of him. He says he hates evil. He fears me. And, and all through the book of Job, you see a conversation with Job's friends and Job's arguments and Job saying, you know, I wish I had a lawyer to stand between me and God. I'd plead my case. I'm innocent. How Come on, going through this. And you know the book of Job well enough to know that's what he goes through all that time. And, and finally, he's asking question. I would ask him this, and I would ask him that. And asking question and question and question after question. And a lot of people in this room have probably said, when I see God, I'm going to ask him these questions. I've got a whole list. And we can think that way. But then the Lord says, who is this that darkens understanding? Who is this who's talking without knowing? Who is this? And God speaks to Job. And he says, let me ask you some questions. And he starts asking some very basic questions for a few chapters. And then Job's response is very simple. He said, I heard of you with the hearing of my ear. But now I see you with the seeing of my eye. And he says, and I'm humbled. I humble myself before you because I spoke without understanding, right? And so what do you think it's going to be like when you, you're before Christ himself? Oh, I don't know. But I, I do wonder if my natural response is going to be to be at his feet. I mean, you see times in the Bible where, where, where the apostle Peter falls at the feet of, of an angel. And the angel has to tell him to get up. I'm a messenger. What are you going to do when you are before the Lord of glory? I can't help but believe the natural place for me is going to be on my face. And I'll be thanking him for what he did for me for what he did for you when you see him. Think about it. That's what's supposed to motivate our lives to serve God because one day we will see him face to face. And I look forward to that. I really do. And so Jesus is speaking. He says, I am. I am the Lord, God says. I'll give my glory to no one else. So if you don't honor Christ, you're not honoring God. In Philippians 2, 10 and 11, Paul said, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He goes on in verse 24 to say, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. The standard of judgment is whether we received or rejected his word. It's our response to God's word that is God's standard for entrance into heaven. In John 12, 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You see, when people hear the message of the gospel repeatedly, it's just adding to the guilt that they have to give an account of because somebody can say, well, I don't really remember hearing, and then the Lord can do an instant replay for you, and you can see how many times you heard and kind of blew it off just rejected it. Well, ultimately, it's hearing his word and believing in the one who sent him. So he's saying, he who hears my word. When he says he hears my word, that re refers to the, the message called the gospel. And somebody said a man must hear the words of Christ in order to believe them, and he must believe in order to keep them, and he must keep them in order to be saved. So it's embracing his words by faith that results in eternal life. It's his word that gives us life. And the life that we have speaks of length of days, but also speaks of, speaks of a quality 
that begins immediately. It's what is called an abundant life. It's not just that we have prolonged days, but it's a quality. It's the quality of those days that we have in him. When you have a relationship with the Lord, he, he blesses you. Like it says in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, this is beautiful. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. So we're in Christ producing fruit. So it's not just hearing, it's hearing and believing that produces life. We not only hear, but we act. In Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. It didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them <laughs> will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. So what are we building our life on? We're to, we're to hear his word and believe in the one who sent him. Now, once again, this reveals the unity of the father and the son. Because those who truly believe the father will believe the son and they receive him as savior. And the result, they shall not come into judgment, but they pass from death into life. Those who embrace his words enter into his grace and mercy immediately. And this is something certain. I remember when I was in the military back in 1971-72. I was in a, a, an organization, a Christian organization that is called the Navigators. Perhaps some of you have heard about it. It's a, a, an organization that would go on college campuses as well as military bases. And, uh, you know, I was a brand new Christian and I needed fellowship. And a friend of mine was part of what was called the Navigators. And they had meetings on, on uh, the fort. And so I went, and this is one of the scriptures that they gave to us that I've always remembered since, since I first heard it. It's 1 John 5, 11 through 13, beautiful scripture. It says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. I, um, on occasion, will speak to people who are, are not sure where they stand with the Lord. I've had people approach me after services before asking, is it possible that I have committed the unpardonable sin and we'll have conversations and I will ask them all have you ever committed your heart to Christ yes are you walking with him at the moment I've been backsliding will I die and go to hell they ask me and I say well I don't know do you care if you're backsliding yes I do are you grieved over your sin yes I am do you want to be right with God yes I do I said you're miserable because you're in sin. You just need to repent and get right with God. You can know that you have eternal life. And this life is in his son. Is it, is it possible for believers to, to become stupid again for a while? Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible for a dog to go back to its vomit? Yeah. And a pig back to the, to the mire? Absolutely. Absolutely. But J. Vernon McGee, one of my favorites in my early days, said it like this. He says, you know, a dog goes back to its vomit and a pig goes back to the mire because by nature they are dogs and pigs. But a child of God may go back to that way of life but will never be blessed or pleased because they're children of God. And they are most miserable because of that until they return to Christ and are washed and cleansed and forsake the vomit that they're calling food. And that's true. Now, I'm not encouraging anybody, by the way, as I think of this, I should say this. 
I'm not encouraging anybody to enjoy your vomit or enjoy the mud. I'm not saying that. You're going to go to heaven. No, what I'm saying is you are most miserable when you're out of the will of God, aren't you? You are most miserable. You're the one who wakes up saying, what happened to me? What happened to me? I used to, but what happened to me? You're backsliding. If you're not going forward, you're going to start going backward. You're backsliding. You're backsliding. The funny thing is, though, or the true thing is, is you can run a thousand miles away from God, but it only takes one step to come back. And that's why he calls us back, so that we might learn to honor him, so that we might learn to have the joy that comes, the abundance of life that he has, to know that you have eternal life. And how come I know that I do? Because I believed what he has said, and I have passed as you have too if you're saved from death into life and I don't enter into judgment in verse 25 most assuredly I say to you the hour is coming now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live those who are spiritually dead will hear his voice those who trust him will live you see again life is granted through faith in the gospel it's the gospel that brings life to those who are spiritually dead it's not our works of righteousness. It's that message of salvation through grace. And it's God's effective means of salvation. Like Paul said in Romans 1.16, when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. In Colossians 2.13, Paul said, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, not just some of them. Sometimes we, we seem to live and act as if we were only forgiven for some of them. And we kind of want to make up to God for all the bad things we've done. When I got saved, I was forgiven for all of my sins. All of them. Not a single one stays on his ledger. Understand that. It's like he took the blood of Christ and poured it on that book that had all your sins on it and washed them all away. And not a single one remains. He has washed us and cleansed us. He says in verse 26, As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he says God has Life in himself, God is self-existent. All life originates with the Father. Like it says in Psalm 36, verse 9, for with you is a fountain of life. But he says in verse 26, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So Jesus has the same kind of life that the Father has in himself. In verse 27, it says he's given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. So as the giver of life, he's the judge over all the living because he's the son of man. At the end of uh, the gospel of Matthew, Jesus makes this clear. Matthew 28, 18, it says uh, that Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, uh, we read, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. And one of the things that I always like to key in on is, like it says, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, every person, no matter what their ethnicity, no matter what their nationality, no matter what their language may be. We're all supposed to, with one heart, give praise and unity to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved us. And so he says in verse 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil the, to the resurrection of condemnation. It is Jesus' voice that will call them physically 
dead, call the physically dead from the graves. I don't know what he's going to say, but that'll be interesting. Maybe he'll say, just uh, get up. I don't know. But he's going to say something to them, and they're, he's going to call them. They're going to hear his voice. And he says, those who have done good will have life, but those who have done evil will be judged. In Daniel 12, 2 and 3, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Turning people to righteousness is another way of saying presenting the good news of salvation. I pray that every person in this room has a heart to see your friends and family saved. I pray that you never rest until they, until either they're saved or you have a sense for the Lord where he says, I've heard your prayer. Because I have to tell you, if there's anything lacking today in the body of Christ, it's, it's, a, it's a lacking in a, of an awareness that our unsaved relatives are perishing. And, and I think the church has gone to sleep in this way in many ways. We kind of like, well, I gave it a shot. I, I tried. My mom, let me share something my mom says. My mom. My mom was kind of bold. My mom was talking to me one day, and she said, you know, David, I was sharing my faith with somebody, and, and they rejected it. So I said in my heart, then go to hell. <laughs> that was my mom. <laughs> I said, you know, Mom, <laughs> with that, I'll take a drink. <laughs> I said, you know, Mama, <laughs> <laughs> this was in her early days. She was a little firebrand. <laughs> I said to her, Mama, I said, that's the problem, huh? That's where they're going to go. I said, so before you, before you get fed up with and impatient with people, you need to remember that's really where they're going to go. So you can never use that kind of phrase lightly because the fact is there is a hell. And without Jesus, that's where the unsaved end up which ought to cause us to have a broken heart for the lost and not an anger and frustration with them. You know, the knowledge that we shall be raised and that we will be with the Lord produces joy in us. Job 19, 25 through 27, I, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my sin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. The psalmist in Psalm 17, 15 said, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And then finally in verse 30, I, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I do nothing outside of the authority of my Father. This is the nature of our unity. I'm not independent of him. So my judgment is righteous because I'm not seeking my own will. I'm not biased. I have nothing in me that's selfish. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do his will. And my judgment ultimately is just. And the reason it is just is because I am just. In Revelation 19, verse 11, we'll close with this. We read, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. We need to remember, and I'll close with this thought, that the baby that was placed in a manger and then was placed on a cross after being placed on the foal of a donkey. He was placed on manger, placed on a donkey, placed on a cross. Well, the same one will be on a horse. On the donkey, as you know, he rode into Jerusalem with peace when he returns 
he rides on a horse for war. I see the Lord Jesus Christ with balance. I see him as that meek, caring, loving Savior. But I also see the ferocious nature of righteousness when he cleanses the temple and when he speaks to Pharisees and calls them unrighteous hypocrites. Same Christ who weeps over cities wept over individuals. He cried over Jerusalem and wept over Lazarus. But he saved, he reserved his harshest words for hypocrisy, for a failure to understand who he is and to live accordingly. And ultimately, he will be our judge. Now, for us as believers, we don't go through the judgment that unbelievers go through. We receive rewards for our works of service. We go to what is called the Bema Seat of Christ to receive reward. Thank God for that. But those who don't know him stand before the great white throne and they receive the penalty due to their sin. And because we do have friends and family who don't know Christ, we need to pray more for them. Or we need to take opportunity when given to us to share a little bit, even if it's as simple as inviting them to church, just to let them know we care, that there is a judgment coming. Because the same one who said, come in, is going to also say, I never knew you. And that's sobering when you consider it. But thank God for those of us who are saved, who are going to hear, well done, come on in. And that is something we all should look forward to.